All right. First, I wanted to play this right quick. Some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with barely sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> Why I played this video is because basically Mark Middleberg referred to this speech as really the turning point in the – sorry, let me turn this off here um, – really the turning point in Reagan's second campaign. And the reason for that is because you know Reagan, you know, obviously a very old man, um, and then Mondale come, comes along and he's you know, a lot – I think it's like 28-year difference or something like that. And he you know, seems a lot more – you know, uh, what's the word? Um, well, lively, I guess you could say. You know, he seemed like he'd be up for the task a little bit better than Reagan would be. Um, you know, and, and everybody was kind of wondering about this. You know, is this going to become an issue? Um, and and but nobody said anything until this reporter said something. You know, like, hey, is, is this going to be an issue? And with a single answer, Reagan not only resolved the issue completely, but then he turned it back on Mondale. See how he did that? And I will also not exploit my opponent's youth and experience, inexperience. See, I mean, with one simple phrase, completely turned it around. And that's kind of what 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 we're talking about tonight with, with this lesson on, on impact is with witnessing. A lot of times we think that we always have to go on the offense. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the defense. But, you know, with witnessing, Mark Middleberg talks about this a hundred times in top ten questions Christians hope no one will ask. What about asking them those questions? You know, oh, there's no God because of evolution. Well, okay, A, evolution really has no bearing on whether or not there's a God or not. He could have used those those means. It's actually kind of wondrous if he didn't. Evolution doesn't resolve the issue of where the first things came from. If there is no God, then what's your purpose in life? See, I mean, turning it back where there, where it suddenly it's not no longer – it's a con conversation now, not so much – you taking you know taking the offense about a bunch of questions you don't know about. See what I mean? Not to say that we have to be aggressive in our witnessing, but when you ask these questions, it makes them think about stuff that they had never thought about. You know what I mean? When we don't ask the questions, um, they they believe that their bias in these things is just the only truth that there is, and that that's just the way it is. See what I mean? We need to be Christians who do. Um, do address the, the things, that pe the questions people are people are raising, but then also are not afraid to turn it back around and, and, and ask them the questions. Um, so th some things I wanted to kind of um, um, Grace, do you have your piece of paper in your pen? Yes. Um, some things I wanted to kind of hit on. Uh, one of them was something that, that Chuck had brought up, um, and that's the the danger of non-denominationals. And why this is a danger is because you know Chuck and I were talking after Yams last week, and sometimes people will mask bad doctrine or lack of doctrine, excuse me, under the title of non-denominational. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because they don't report to anybody, they they they're just under themselves. So technically, you could be non-denominational church and believe the exact same things as Mormons or Jehovah's Witness. Technically speaking, because you're non-denominational, you're not with anybody, you're not affiliated with anybody. Yeah. You could teach whatever you so desire, and there's no way of distinguishing that. Not to say that all non-denominationals are bad, but it's kind of a red flag if you see um, house churches, if you see non-denominational churches, kind of a red flag. Doesn't mean they're bad. Just you know, don't, don't get, give it some give it some time to figure out what they believe first right. before you go and uh, sign up for everything. Um, also. I want to point out the fact that false belief is dangerous because it leads to more false belief. For instance, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the charismatic cult, and we talked about Christians who are meaning well, but with the Holy Spirit, they kind of just are way off balance, right? And so then what happens when you believe in those kinds of weird doctrines? Well, then you have a habit of going to the other extreme, um, you know, like let's say from charismatic to Mormon. Or from um, um, from Jehovah's Witness to at, and all of a sudden you're questioning everything. 
I mean, even the aspect of reality itself. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 I mean, we have seen things like this happen, even amongst us. So, I mean, you guys truly know, know the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. But bad belief leads to bad belief, and it leads to skepticism. It leads to fear. It leads to all kinds of different things. So even if somebody hypothetically had, was perfectly had no, had no false doctrine in their life, went into Jehovah's Witness and had their doctrine corrupted and was able to come back, even still... It's not like it's going to be some rainbow where, where, where there is no effect on their life. There will always be that effect. And often, most often, it will be to the other extreme. You remember on the Jonestown documentary how the people went from being in the cult yeah. to now, oh, I don't even believe in God anymore. Right. Extreme to extreme. See what I mean? Because um, that's the effect of, of, of cults. That's the effect of uh, false, false doctrines and false beliefs. Um, and so we're going to talk about the impact tonight with how cults have impacted the church and how um, the church can impact the world. Uh, but at, before we do that, um, uh, we were going to sign people up for the baking contest. Who wants to be in the baking contest? You? Okay. You? Yes? Okay. Now, uh, so everybody besides check this here and sign me up too. And I'll, I'll uh, text other people and see if they're interested. Um, and so what this baking contest is going to involve is next week I will give you a, a packet that will have a, um, uh, one or two sacred ingredients. One's going to be a regular ingredient, like, you know, sugar or something. But then the other one's going to be something way out there, um, like, you know, Skittles or some nonsense like that. And you have to find some way to combine this into your, into your dessert dish. It has all of the dishes have to be desserts. Okay. You have to find some way to, to combine it into the dish that... It feels like you did it on purpose. Mm. Okay. okay. So, and the dishes will be given in anonymously, and everybody will try from them who is voting um, anonymously. They won't know who made what until afterwards. Okay. So, um, okay. So I'll text the rest of the people, okay? Okay. So that takes us into what we're talking about tonight, and that is impact. Um, with a lot of. A lot of worldviews, there are ginormous gaps in the worldview, but yet they have this idea that their worldview is is pretty much – it's just the way to go. It's faultless. you know. And it's important when you're talking with these people that you that you pick up on the, on the extremist views. You know what I mean? Views that aren't necessarily part of their belief system, but they take it to the, to the extreme, like science disproving God. Well, no, because science deals with the physical world, so it can't possibly measure the metaphysical. Therefore, science can neither prove nor disprove God. See what I mean? But some people who believe in science take it to the extreme of saying, yes, it disproves God. See what I mean? And so it's, it's important to realize the, the, those blind spots in every worldview. And every worldview, even Christian worldviews, have blind spots that we don't even sometimes realize until somebody comes along and says something. They're like, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, atheism, the belief that there was nothing and nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything, and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. In essence, this is atheism. See what I mean? And if you put it like that, well, okay, yeah, it does sound a little bit ridiculous. See what I mean? But for some reason, media at large has this idea that atheism just makes the most sense. So you have really loud people like Seth MacFarlane and um, uh, Bill Mayer. What was his name? Bill Mayer, is that his name? However you say his name. Um, that guy. And these people who are just really loud. And if you listen to their arguments, they'll be very circular and just kind of dumb sometimes. But because they say it so often and so loud, people just assume that it's completely right and there's no fault in that belief system. See what I mean? Like relativism, that you can believe whatever you want, uh, as long as you as long as you know you believe it, and you can't hold anybody else to your belief system. That sounds good, except for when you apply it to the real world. So I'm just gonna go 40 down this road. Well, the speed limit's 20. See what I mean? It, it, see what I mean? That you you can't just make up your own reality in the real world. Why would you be able to with anything else? Not only that, but as I've pointed out multiple times. Making the claim that, that every claim is valid is itself a claim, which disproves the claim that every claim is valid, because then that would mean that, that there is no claim. Would be would, The claim is a valid claim, which contradicts what you're saying. See what I mean? So you have the circular reasoning that sounds real smart and that everybody seems to agree on until you actually start to dissect the thing. So the first thing with witnessing is always analyze. When somebody's talking, always listen very, very closely to what they're saying. Very, very closely. Your ears are going to be one of your biggest assets in any witnessing experience. Um, 
So if, if you really study the effects of, of cults and, and whatnot and, and how they've corrupted the church and, and, and how this the, just culture has been so adapted and changed throughout time, you'll see that some things were – how do I want to say this? Some things are strongly connected to certain ideas but didn't necessarily come from them. Like, for instance, hippies. All, all create all things are equal you know this this misplaced love that you know you have to love the world and everything you know it's just this misplaced idea of, of all this but it didn't originate with the hippies see I mean it didn't ori originate there um, they, they took some aspects of that to a new level but it didn't originate with them um, and Buddhism you know plays on this but once again this idea was around before Buddhism just Buddhism highlighted certain aspects of it and kind of strengthened certain aspects of it see you know what I mean that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So all these, although the, the ideas on the right hand side are closely related with the ideas on the left hand side, they weren't necessarily direct cause and effect relationships. Um, atheism, law for man, but then again, before atheism, there uh, other people believed that the law was for man, anyways. So, I mean, I mean that goes all the way back to um, Babylon and whatnot. I mean that goes far back. Um, Jonestown, lawless social religion, but once again, this is an aspect that wasn't specifically to um, to Jonestown. And why I keep pointing this out is because I at first sat down with the intent of this. I'm going to, to point out the cults and trace the history of all these things Excuse me, back to the cult, except that these things trace from before the cult. See what I mean? So I, although these things did negatively affect, affect the church, it didn't necessarily start with them, but it was worsened by them. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really getting at is there is nothing new under the sun. Cults regurgitate the same nonsense that has been said in other ways throughout history. The only difference is they say it in a new culture, in a new context. See what I mean? And so with, with the truth of God, it's something that hasn't changed throughout the context, and it's something that we need to make sure doesn't change even though our methods of telling about it does change. For instance, th there may can't come a day when a church when the churches no longer meet in buildings. That may be a thing that happens, but will it be the end of the world? No, it won't be the end of the world because we'll just find a new way to tell the and tell the message, a new method, if you will. Does that make sense? But the message will always stay the same: that Christ died for sinners. Um. <clears throat> So we see a lot of love without truth in Jonestown. Just this mis this idea of taking love without the without the boundary of of of, of truth. Um, social religion, but kind of lawless. You see what I mean? Um, the charismatic thing, a misplaced role of the spirit, or either overemphasizing or deemphasizing the role of the spirit. I'm going to extremes on these things. The word of faith, faith and prayer overemphasized. You know, the, what, what does prayer do? Oh, well, you just say in prayer and it, it's accomplished. Well, no, not necessarily. You understand what I mean? But they take it to that extreme. Um, the, the faith becomes something that you conjure up within yourself. It's no longer trust in God. It's something that, that it's like some inner power, almost like um, uh, Hindus' view of that, you know, that. It's a lot of, like, mind over matter. Yeah, yeah. Just like in the Hindu belief of that, um, that uh, essence within yourself that you can just it kind of spark. yeah 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 kind of like that um, I'm dreading the fact that I'm forgetting what these things are called um, Gnosticism no distinction of roles there there's there's no difference between man and woman and, and and with the Bible we do see that in salvation there's no difference between man and woman but in roles there are husbands are called to do different things than the wives are called to do you know um, Christian science and speaking things into existence like healing. Um, Mormons with their way mis big misunderstanding of the priesthood um, and Satan is Jesus' brother. I mean, how how many times have you heard that one? Satan being Jesus' brother? I remember growing up, um, I had heard that from I don't even know where, and I said something like that to, to mom and dad. They're like, where'd you get that? <laughs> you know, in, in essence, what that does is that makes Satan and, and Jesus kind of like co-equals, you know what I mean? Yeah. But that's the difference is Satan was created. And Jesus wasn't. Right. Satan is just an angel that's fallen. Jesus is God and always has been God. So, I mean, very big difference. But once again, kind of blurs the line there. Um, Jehovah's Witness, uh, big misunderstanding and overemphasis on the end times and God's character. Um, really, it's just sad. That what they do is they, they take the end times and they just kind of had a heyday with it. You know, kind of went crazy with it. And then they took God's character... I mean, it just raped it. 
um, you know, took the, the, the trinity that the Bible talks about and turned it into this, you know. And here's the thing that confuses me. Another thing, well, another thing that confuses me about called such as Jehovah's Witness. They'll say something like this. How many gods are there? There's one God. Okay. So is Jesus God? No, he's a God. Okay, but you just said there's one God. Well, there's only one God Almighty. Well, yeah, except that the Bible doesn't make any distinction between that. See what I mean? So you, then, then you say that, and they say, well, it do, 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 do. And it's like, okay, let's start over again. Exodus says ha that there's how many gods? Well, one. See what I mean? And you go into this thing, and they don't see the, the hypocrisy in what they're saying. But and, and it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. It's it's all of these really have the same kind of repeating things. Um, reason being elevated beyond logic. I know that doesn't make sense, but still they do it. Um, relativism. All ideas. All ideas are equally valid. I mean, it sounds really good, but just a complete lie from Satan. Um, spiritism. Spiritual real over emphasize. Spiritual reality overemphasized. Um. So. But if you notice behind the cults, there's always this atmosphere in it. There's always this attitude behind it. And I, 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 when I use the term spirit, I don't mean like a, a, a like a spirit is in like an angel or something. I mean a spirit is in like an attitude or atmosphere. There's a spirit of, in the cult that's that's just very um, anti-Christian, anti-Christ, but also. Um, Kind of, it, it's these little attitudes that kind of drive the cult itself. For instance, in the Jehovah's Witness, there's a big fear of the end, a big fear of the end. Um, but also, there's a there's this there's this um, over dominating attitude of superiority. You know what I mean? Where they see themselves as better than everyone else. And then you go into the cult and you start reading their material and you start seeing what they're saying about it. Every other organized religion is Satan is Satan's uh, organization that Satan himself has founded. You know, and it's like okay, um, what about the, the Christian? Oh no, the Christian church. You know, yeah, yeah, they are they are Satan's organization because the gospel was was corrupted. Even though we have no historical proof that this ever happened, and even though God, and even Jesus, by by the way, even Jesus himself said that this would not happen. That he would always have people for himself. Somehow they get away with this false, retarded doctrine that this truth has been corrupted and only they can restore it. Okay. So then you go back to the origins of it. Charles Russell, where, where was his origin? Well, <coughs> just with himself. He didn't find any, any, any historical document. He just came to the conclusion himself. Joseph Smith. Did he receive any special? No, no, he didn't. He claimed to have found some some mysterious um, tablets out in, under dirt. I mean, it's a little bit ridiculous. Where are these Where are these tablets today? Well, they the angel took them. Of course, the angel took them with nobody else ever seeing them, and it's just like okay, you know what I mean. Going past the realms of believability because of these underlying attitudes. Um. <clears throat> But also uh, within Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness, you see um, a lot of anger. You know what I mean? A lot of um, just – I don't know if you guys have ever really um, rubbed shoulders with Jehovah's Witness in the context of witnessing. But they are very, very angry all the time. Aggressive. And very aggressive. Very aggressive. And the instant that you even say something that sounds – uh, more reasonable, even setting aside scripture, more reasonable than what they say. They, like they go into this ravenous, you know, uh, rabid fren frenzy. It's 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 kind of a little bit alarming, you know. And, and you see them on the street, and they don't look happy. And then when you talk to them just one on one, like like if you guys have any friends that have been Jehovah's Witness, um, they they put on this front all the time, like, oh no, I've got it all together, I'm totally happy. But then when you see them living out their lives, it's very evident that they're not very happy. So they're like, okay. Um, but then like the atheist, a strong distaste for God or disdain for religion. Um, a lot of atheists that I have personally known um, are people who at one point have been wronged by religion. And so they go to the other extreme. Oh, there's no God. Okay, well, I'm glad you're putting your faith in man and not God. See what I mean? We don't put our faith in man. I'm going to fail you one day if I haven't already, and you guys are all going to fail me. Do you know why? Because you're people, and I'm people. That's just what happens with people. But we don't put our, our faith in, in people and in the perfection that can be attained by people. We put our faith in God and the perfection that he already is by his very nature. See what I mean? Um, the pointlessness of, knife, of life, a, a, a reaction of Hinduism. I mean if you, if you come to the conclusions of Hinduism, 
life really is pointless. You you just do good, I guess, for whatever you think is good until you die, and then hopefully you will have worked up enough good karma to boomerang you into a higher level in your next reincarnation, and then you get to do it all over again until finally you reach the higher the highest level where you just kind of drift off into the all spark. Well, that's real comforting. And what happens if you do bad? Or I'll tell you something even worse. Let's say a past life has bad karma that catches up, catches up to you into the life after this life and boomerangs you down even though you were a good person in this life. Well, that sucks. So I'm coming back as a grasshopper. I don't know what the levels are, but you see what I'm saying. Um, just these root attitudes behind the cults and, and the occult and, and other religions. So... Now we actually get to the stuff that, that, that's important. First off, do not attack. Whenever you're witnessing to people, don't ever attack. I know this is very difficult to do, especially when you're dealing with cultists, because they'll believe the same dumb thing. And even in the light of you showing them scripture, reason, logic, science, everything, they will blindly believe their view to the very end. See what I mean? It's something that you cannot win by your words. So that's the first thing. Do not attack. Don't get in this idea of me versus you where you get into this anger thing because then you're not going to accomplish anything good. Um, second off, define terminology, repeat, and reword. Define terminology, repeat, and reword they, over and over again. Whenever they say something is salvation, now what do you mean by salvation? Whenever they say God, now, now what do you mean by God? Because Mormons, for instance, will say something about God, but then it comes out that there's all kinds of gods, but they just worship one of them. Well, see what I mean? That That's a little bit of a hidden a hidden thing there. See what I mean? In the Bible, we are Bible-believing Christians, which means we believe that there are no other gods. There are no other gods. There is one God, which leads us to the conclusion with Jesus that if he, he is a God, he is, no, he is nothing less than the God. See what I mean? It, there is no other conclusion. Either there is only one God or there are multiple gods, and the Bible makes it clear that there's only one God. You cannot arrive at any other conclusion. Um, so keep defining the terminology, and, and, and then you say, well, now, I, now when I say this, I mean this. You, you know, Use other words. Don't use Christian words. Use generic terms, dictionary definitions. Explain what you mean and re-explain what you mean. Um, repeat what you said. Um, a lot of times, occultists will just breeze past whatever you said and just come back around to some other way. Repeat it back in. Now, hold on. I said this, though. See what I mean? I said that I believe that Jesus was God. And they'll go off. Now, okay, yeah, I heard what you're saying, but I, I said that Jesus was God. See what I mean? And you just kind of have to repeat the things, not in a downgrading way. You know, you have to talk down to them. But it, they, they are going to, it is going to be kind of a circular thing where it feels like you're not making a whole lot of um, way forward uh, in some parts. And then reword it. Maybe they're not understanding the way that you're saying something. See what I mean? So reword it or ask them a question that causes them to think about what you're saying. See what I mean? And oftentimes when you ask them a question, they'll just kind of write it off. Bring back the question. Now, now hold on, hold on. We'll, we'll get to that. But what do you think about this? See what I mean? Just kind of, kind of give them time to think about what you're saying. Um, now keep in mind, though, for the people who are the people who are knocking at your doors, they're going to be the devout ones that know their beliefs pretty darn good. Okay? You're in a better luck on the people who just go to the church. The people that you're going to bump into, your neighbors, your your friends, your friends' friends. Those are the people that you're actually going to make a lot more headway with. The people who are knocking at your door, they've already progressed to the level that they're already prepared for every anti-argument that you're going to say, yeah. probably. So once again, sometimes the Holy Spirit will guide you. And I'm not saying you shouldn't talk to these people. I'm just saying don't get discouraged by the fact that you're not going to probably win over instantly the people who come to your door. You may say something that eventually brings them in, or you may eventually, through the process of talking to them, bring them in. But don't get discouraged just because those people aren't saved. It's not it's not the end of your witnessing experience. Um, communicate, don't assume or teach. Ben talked about this. Mormons, you can be a Mormon and believe a whole different view of different things. And we talked about in Hinduism how you could believe all kinds of different views on God from there is – wait. I believe one of the Hindus believe no, there is one God. There are many gods. God is in everything. I mean, Hinduism belief, belief of God really ranges from everything. Um, <clears throat> so uh, always communicate with them and ask questions. You know, ha listen to what they're actually saying rather than assuming what what you think that they believe. Okay. Um, now some cults that's not going to be as important. Um, 
but it's still important that you listen, but it's there probably isn't going to be much variation. Jehovah's Witness isn't going to have a whole lot of variation. Mormonism, on the other hand, is going to have a whole lot of variation. See what I mean? So there, there's going to be big leaps in between the two. So just kind of, once again, though, um, communicating and listening will, will always make sure that you're in a safe place. Um, don't The instant that you talk, especially with New Age cultists, with the instant that you start teaching them, they tune you out. Don't teach. Okay? This becomes very difficult because you're going to be communicating with them, asking them questions, and very softly treading. Very softly treading. Now, obviously, New Age cultists are an extremist cult. So it's going to be harder with them than it is for, let's say, um, your average Mormon. See what I mean? Um, <coughs> also, sometimes people, when they believe something at their core, will argue fiercely about it, even if what you're saying they know in their heart is true. They will still fight fiercely in the moment. But then later, when they're all alone, they'll kind of think about what you said. Okay, so once again, another reason not to get too discouraged about these kinds of things. Um just because you don't lead someone to Christ right here and right now doesn't mean you didn't do something that God wanted you to do. Okay, Don't get discouraged. Keep going. Um, plus, don't forget that not everybody you witness to is going to be a cultist. So there's that too. Um, use authority beside your own. Don't just appeal to your own knowledge. You know, appeal to, to someone else. You know, like, well, Charles Russell once, Russell once said this. Or, you know... Um, well, uh, you know, whoever their authority figure is, you know, an atheist, for instance, well, Richard Dawkins once said this, you know what I mean? You're appealing to, to someone else's besides your own authority. Um, Jesus could do that because he was God, but we aren't God, so you don't have to appeal to your own authority. Um, don't criticize. Um, a lot of times when we're countering somebody else's view, um, we can hop instantly to the criticism. Well, that's just a dumb idea. See what I mean? Don't criticize. It goes right in hand in hand with do not attack. Attack is attacking the person. Criticizing is um, critiquing what they're saying. So I mean, rather than criticizing it, rather points to a better way. Does that make sense? It's kind of like um, positive. They call it positive and negative reinforcement with children. You can either uh, negatively reinforce that your children uh, don't drop that, or else, or you can positively reinforce them. If you don't drop that, you know. Let's see. Let's see who can carry our milk to the kitchen table without dropping it. See what I mean? Both are saying the exact same thing. Just one has a negative tone to it. The other one has a positive tone to it. It's kind of the exact same thing with this. You say that in essence the same thing. You just say it in a positive way that, rather than a negative way. Does that make sense? You want to avoid, um, you know, the negative words like no and whatnot, um, and, and substitute them for more positive words and just think about what you're saying and, and word it in a positive way. You know, you can say the same thing multiple ways. Um, Commend the positive that you see in them. You know, like for instance, they're really devout, maybe, you know, faithful in the thing. Um, notice underlying statements. For instance, a lot of times you'll be talking to somebody and they'll be saying stuff, and you can just pick up on, oh, this guy's a moral relativist. See what I mean? He doesn't think that there's any moral absolutes. See what I mean? And you can pick up on these things, and it'll help guide the discussion of your the the way you're the way you're talking about. Which obviously experience will tell you um, how that how it can affect your um, discussion. Uh, point to inconsistencies, inconsistencies in their doctrine and consistency in your own without criticizing them. Um, like, for instance, well, you said this, but I'm confused. You also said this. Does, don't those two, I, don't both those ideas kind of go against each other? See, and then they'll explain for a little bit, and then you'll say, well, I believe this. See what I mean? And so you're not really criticizing them. You're just making yourself seem very... Naive, not naive, but very calm. You're making yourself seem like the good guy. It's not you versus their church. It's maybe you two just talking about a third party. See what I mean? It, it suddenly changes the atmosphere of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> uh, be patient, but act quickly. Um, first off, be patient. You know, like I said, things Rome wasn't built in a day. Okay, But also act quickly. Don't get the idea that... Um, you know, you have all the time in the world. They're only at your door for a few minutes. Whatever you're gonna do, do it. You know what I mean? If if you're gonna make time and go talk to them about the Bible, do it. You know what I mean? Don't don't him haw right it. Oh, well, maybe if you come back and did it. No, I wouldn't do that. You, first off, you don't know if the same people will come back. You, I mean, just all the different things. See the opportunity when you got it. Uh, but also, you know, once again, be patient and actually listen to what they're saying. Um, and if you
If you're anything like me, people will start talking, and you'll already know what they're saying before they even have the first sentence down, and you'll already have all of their problems figured out and the solution on the tip of your tongue. And you're just waiting for them to shut up so you can tell them how to fix their life. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> um, uh, point to the nature and identity of God and the Trinity. For instance, with Muslims, they don't Muslims they don't have the comfort that we do in Christ. They don't have the religion. I'm sorry, the relationship that we do in Christ. See what I mean? The, uh, their view of God is very, very. Um, he's very extreme, but they also call him um, call him loving and merciful. Okay, so th they believe that he's loving and merciful, but they don't have an actual one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. They don't believe that that's possible. Personal. Yes. And they don't believe that it's even possible to have a personal relationship with them. Okay? And their idea of paradise, once again, excuse me, doesn't dwell on God's goodness, it dwells on pleasures. Like their virgins, for instance. I do wonder though, do their virgins stay virgins, like even after they or <laughs> is it like a one time like a new <laughs> gift that you open and then it's open forever? I don't know. <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> Ask them about it. Uh, right? <laughs> Um, emphasize salvation by grace. <laughs> love your enemies and serve. When you when you serve them, when you when you truly love them, they will pick up on that. But emphasize that because people people are always striving to be saved by works, but they always desire to be saved by more than works. Always, somewhere deep in, in the heart of every single person, they, they greatly desire that their works will one day be done. But they will always see, uh, strive uh, to do more and more works for their salvation. Even Christians do this. It's something within us. We feel that the the need to, to always prove ourselves. E right? E even outside of our, our relationship with God. We have to earn our love with our spouse. We have to earn our love with our kids, with our parents. We're always doing things to impress. Even people who have had their parents die are in this destructive pattern of, of constantly trying to prove themselves to their parents when their parents aren't even alive anymore. You know what I mean? Just these these, these destructive patterns that we repeat and we repeat and we repeat. Um, so emphasize that. Salvation being by grace. Um, <clears throat> obviously having an attitude of patience, love, gentleness, and kindness. These are these are things that the, the Bible mentions are gifts of the Spirit. Which means that as you seek God, these things come. Okay? Um, if you notice there, though... Um, Gentleness is something that the Holy Spirit gives to all Christians, not just the female Christians. See, oftentimes we make it out to be gentleness is for women. No, it's for everyone. See what I mean? Um, depend on the Holy Spirit. These are things we've talked about before. You know, always pray for guidance and always, you know, follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Um, discuss from common ground. For instance, if you're talking to an atheist, mentioning the Bible is going to mean absolutely nothing to them. Re re depend on something that they depend on themselves science for instance um, stay in prayer and scripture if you want to be prepared in and out of season at all times no matter what stay in the word and stay in prayer that is how you will be prepared because I guarantee you this that one time that you don't stay in the word and in prayer for just a few days there will be something that you could have done that you won't be able to do because you weren't in the word and prayer it's just the way it goes I don't know how but it's just you know just the way it works um, stay connected with the body. Um, all you know, go to go to services. You know, call people up in church. You know, make friends with these people. Um, you know, do whatever you can to, to really um, to really connect with the church. I was talking to one person, and they said, you know, I, I just feel I just feel like I don't belong in the church. I don't feel like you know I don't feel welcome. And I said, well, you know, you come late, you leave early, and you sit in the back all by yourself. And then when you're not in church, you don't talk to any of these people. Of course, you're not going to feel like you belong. You know what I mean? I, I'm not trying to, to oversimplify. Put forth an effort. Right, you have to put forth an effort. I'm not trying to oversimplify your problem, but I mean, it, you do have to put forth work for a relationship with somebody. If you get married, it's not like you get married and okay, we'll have sex every other week and and you know I'll talk to you in a few days. No, you, you, the whole marriage is based on the on the foundation of you guys talking. See what I mean? Um, <clears throat> uh, never associate with someone causing problems in the body. They will over. Uh, they will corrupt you. The problem will get worse. Now, this is something I, I want to emphasize. Okay, in the Bible, it talks about certain people to avoid and to kick out of your assembly and whatnot. For the longest time, I thought these were people with false beliefs. Yes, but not in the same way as cultists have false beliefs. 
He's talking about people in the church who are spreading false doctrine and causing problems in the church. Spreading rumors about people, talking behind people's back, maybe not being on, on on board with the leadership, not giving in financial terms, not you know, being not 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 being on the same page as the church, going in a different direction. These people, he said, you know, they're, they're living in sin and they're they're not even repenting. And these are these are bold things that are hurting the church. Kick them out, like the, like the guy that was having sex with his father's wife. Kind of gross. And what do you say about that person? Kick him out. See I mean, those were the people he said, and and First John, he's talking about all these people who are starting false doctrine, right? And then he says, don't even associate with these people. They're causing a problem in the church. Don't even associate with them. So when you see somebody in a church that's causing problems, when you see somebody who's constantly talking bad about the pastor or or the or the you know or this or that, always complaining about something with the church, have nothing to do with these people. Why? First off, they will corrupt you. I have seen good Christians be corrupted by these by these terrible people. People who I never thought would stumble and they did. That's something that will happen. I don't think you're above it because no Christian is. You are, what does it say, bad company corrupts good morals? It's the exact same thing here. This is actually a great uh, application. But also the problem will get worse. I was, there, is, there is one person who she was a problem person, okay? And things started to get better. So things started to get better. And then people started lending her an ear. The problem got worse. The people who started lending her an ear got sucked into it. And it became a big deal. See, it, it was resolving itself. It was being fixed. She was actually growing. But because, once again, they didn't listen to Paul and John's warnings of avoiding these people, they repeated the offense. And it got worse. And these people started to become gossips. See what I mean? And so a big problem was caused off something that wasn't a big deal. She was changing. See what I mean? So once again, don't don't even. And once again, Paul says that that when you avoid these people, it shames them, and they draw and they and they're drawn into repentance to it. He says this in First Corinthians. He, he's, he's talking about this. You know what happened? Is she felt. A Alone, she realized what she was doing was wrong, and she started to change her behavior because she realized that she was wrong, and it was not in line with scripture or with anything else. People didn't have to go and condemn her and make her feel like an idiot. The people just had to love God and keep praying, and she saw the difference, and she started to change. But then people started lending her an ear. See what I mean? Um, it's like interrupting a, 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 a um, caterpillar when it's still turning into butterfly. You kill it. It, it doesn't finish its transition. Um, so let's talk about a new mindset. <clears throat> before actually, before we get into that, any questions on witnessing or on the impact that the cults have had? Okay. All right. Um, when you're witnessing with cultists, it gets very upsetting, and it's easy to remember this. Forget. It's easy to forget this. God loves everyone, and you have to always remind yourself of this. Your enemy is God loves. The child molesters that you find so irresistible. I'm not irresistible. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. That was not the word that I meant to, meant to say. I am, I am seriously sorry. I did not mean that. Um, the child molesters that you find so repulsive. Oh, my gosh. I'm so embarrassed. I could not be more embarrassed. No, wait. Yeah, I could. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'm sorry. The child molesters that we find so repulsive, you know, the... Um, uh, cultists that we find so annoying, uh, liars, you know, people that, that, that really rub us the wrong way, God loves them too. See what I mean? And it's, and it's also hard to forget that, as there I go again, it's also easy to forget, why is my mouth backwards tonight? <laughs> and I can't recover. Every time I try to recover, I keep sucking it, sucking back in. Anyways, um, what was I saying? <laughs> It, it's easy to forget also um, that once someone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, okay? And Christ will continue the work that he started. That make sense? Yeah. Which means, let's say Ben is a child molester. He's not, but let's just say he is, okay? Then he gets saved. He leaves the life. Uh, repenting literally means turning away from. So when someone says that they're saved and they continue in the action for a substantial amount of time, they're, they're not saved. It's that simple. 
repentance is turning from. So then he gets saved, actually saved. He repents. He, he turns from that way of life. Is he child molester? No. Now, the state, obviously, he is still going to have to report with the state and that kind of stuff. Okay. However, before God, he's a new creation. See what I mean? Ser Serena's a shoplifter. Okay? And, once again, she's not, but... She is for this example. Um, and, and she turns from that. She's no longer a shoplifter. Now, should she make amends with the people that she's stolen? Yeah, she should make amends with the people that she's stolen from. Remember the story of Zacchaeus in the Gospels? If I've ever tore, uh, ripped off anybody, I will pay them back and then some. Yeah. See what I mean? Yes, you should make amends. True repentance tries to make m amends, by the way. But sure, you see what I'm saying. Um... The cultist acts out of blindness and severe bias. Um, don't go to a cultist thinking that they know what they're doing is wrong. Go to it with the knowledge that they are genuinely con deceived and that they are conceived is what I was going to say. Genuinely deceived, genuinely lost. See what I mean? And when you start realizing that this is something that is the basis of them as a person, that they cling to, just like the people in Jonestown did before they killed themselves. See what I mean? Once you start realizing that, it starts changing the way you're thinking about them. Um, and also, this severe bias that undergirds all of them is going to be evident in their words. So when you're witnessing them, don't get upset and, and lose your temper because what you say is based off of your foundation, which is Christ. What they say is based off their foundation, which is Satan. See the difference? Um, you are called to persevere, recharge, and try again. Sometimes you're going to have some really doozy, doozies for uh, witnessing. Take it. Take a step back. Take take a breath. Maybe maybe take a day off or something like that. You know, go up to the mountains, do whatever you need to do. Spend a couple day. Spend a couple hours in a hot bath. Whatever you need to do, recharge and get back in there. But I will say this: um, when you aren't doing what you're supposed to in God, you have to keep doing these things to recharge your your batteries, like going on vacations. Except they do less and less for you, so you have to go on more and more vacations. Or whatever else you, you would normally do. Playing video games. You would need to play more video games to relax. Um, you know, all these things. How do you avoid this this circle of getting worse and worse with your, you needing to recharge? Prayer. I know, it's, I know it sounds like a load, but it, honestly, if you are in ministry, stay in prayer, even past the times when you just don't feel like praying anymore, and you'll find yourself feeling more rejuvenated than you would have by taking your vacations and all these other things. So, anyways... Um, and prayer and scripture are the most important things you can use. That that's the I know um, I've been emphasizing apologetics, you know, knowing what you believe and all these different things. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is staying in scripture and staying in prayer. That is the most important thing you can do. Um, past reading all the books, past knowing all the answers, past everything else, staying in prayer. Um, healing is a process. It's it's going to be something that that requires time with anybody stuck in it. In a cultist worldview, it's not going to be something that is accomplished overnight. However, keep in mind that you have the keys of life. You can't give up. You have the keys of life. Don't forget that. If you give up, someone could lose out on salvation. If you feel like giving up, just think of it like this. What if I was the cultist? And I was stuck in this lie. And I actually deluded myself. Yes, into believing, I, I'm second guessing every word I'm saying now, into, into believing that, that, that you are actually saved. Would you want somebody to at least try and warn you? Or would you want to be left in your ignorance to go to hell? See, I mean, that doesn't sound like fun. So treat them with that same urgency that you'd want people to treat with you. But once again, listen to what they're saying. Always, always listen. Be slow to speak. James says this, be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Um, never stop seeking answers. You know, sometimes when we start learning, we get to a certain area that we think we're good at. We kind of just stop studying the Bible. We stop studying, you know, different things like apologetical books because we're just we're smart enough. You know what I mean? We're we're, we're good enough, and we just kind of do this. And you have all the knowledge, but nothing to go with the knowledge. Right. So now, uh, just have this mindset that you are continually being remade. Once you have that mindset, it's it's a lot easier. I'm sorry. I flipped past there a couple times. Once you have the, that mindset that you're being continually remade every day, it's going to be a lot easier to remember, you know, I, I haven't arrived yet.
haven't arrived yet. But I'm a really good person now, you haven't arrived yet. So I mean, just keep that in your head. You'll know when you arrive because you'll be seeing God. Um, one of the hardest factors to witness, witnessing is realizing that God loves the one that you dis so despise. But once you begin to realize his never-ending love, you understand your own um, salvation in a new way that encourages fresh witnessing attempts. When you feel like quitting, you realize God never quit. When you are in pain, you realize God died for his enemies. See, once you stop looking at yourself and you start realizing, comparing yourself to God, oh, I just don't want to do this anymore. God hasn't gave up on humanity throughout endless centuries, and he's been doing everything that he can throughout all of history to, to restore people back to himself. I think that maybe we need to second guess um, giving up. Um, so. So just some factors to cultic belief. First off is the ignorance of scripture. We talked about this quite a few times. People who are either um, just folk Christians who don't really know what the Bible says, um, or people who know of the Bible, they just really don't know what's in there. Like, oh, I think it says something about cleanliness being next to godliness. You know, Or people who, who um, maybe have heard things from the Bible but have not studied it, and as a result, the seed has not grown. Um so just in a general ignorance of scripture, uh, no authority structure. A lot of times um, when we don't have authority in our lives, it'll just travel, travel into other areas of our life. For instance, um, it's not uncommon for, for guys who, who cannot be under someone else's authority uh, to be in porn or something like that. You know, Because they, they start objectifying things, they start seeing themselves as overly smart, everybody else becomes ignorant. Um, you know, They start setting up for themselves as their own authority structure, and as a result, they take advantage of women. These kinds of things have sex before marriage, dishonor, their, dishonor these women, and then they marry, that, marry the women that they've dishonored, you know, and, and it just kind of keeps... Um, Going, going down and down until the um, relationship just really deteriorates to a place of just ugliness. The root problem being no authority structure. See what I mean? Um, just, uh, and we saw that with Jonestown, didn't we? Jim Jones, he used to be with the Summers of God. But then what happened? He didn't submit to their authority, and he decided to go off on his own random whatever. They kicked him out, and then his doctrine just kept deteriorating until he ended up in Africa. And with a whole bunch of people lying dead around him. See what I mean? Um, justified attitudes or sins. You know, I, I've just been hurt so much by this that it's okay for me to feel this way. Oh, that guy's a total a hole. I can feel bad. I can, I can, I can have this attitude towards him. See what I mean? Justifying those attitudes. And a lot of people who are in the cult or cults will will have this because with Christianity, you learn about how you are supposed to forgive. Especially your worst of enemies and love people, and that's a very difficult thing to do. It's easy to say that you do, but it's hard to actually follow through with. Um, emotionally compromised men, uh, mentality, you know, they're not, let's say, all here. And I'm not just talking about um, a, a mental illness like bipolar or stuff like that. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I, I'm talking about, let's say, um, like Jim Jones. Who did he go to? He went to the outcasts, the people who didn't fit. You know the, the the minorities, the 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 women, the, the people who people were looking down on. He went uneducated. to them. Yeah, the uneducated, the people who people looked down on. He went to them, and that's what I'm talking about here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, also, uh, just an imbalance of doctrine that's never been corrected. You know, like um, for instance, animal cruelty. You know, people go to extremes on this. And I was talking about this on Facebook. Either they fall in love with animals and all their life becomes about animals, or they just tear the crap out of the planet. Well, God told us to be stewards of the, of the world. You know, we're supposed to take care of the world. But our main focus is not taking care of the world, is it? Our main focus is witnessing, loving people. See what I mean? Yeah. Blowing that way out of proportion. Like, for instance, I recycle. Why? Because it's just a little thing that helps. It's not like a big deal. I'm not going to go and proclaim people, you need to recycle. You know, I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm not a recycling evangelist. <laughs> what I am is a Christian. So I mean, I do that to do to to help out to, with preserving the world. But my main focus is teaching people about God. So I mean, that's the thing that's most important. So once again, that imbalanced doctrine, going to extremes on stuff that's not really necessary to go on with extremes on, or end times. Once again, is it important to know about the end times only as much as it is to draw an application? Why is it important to understand Revelations? Because God wins. That no matter what you're going through, God, or it, it, Revelation says that God literally ordained the hard times. Well, how would we know that if we don't read Revelations? 
It says that, that one of the main reasons why Christians have struggles all the time is because Satan is angry and so he's attacking the church. Well, that's good to know. See what I mean? Thing, but, but at the very end, what happens? God wins. God had all of it under control the whole time and he wins. See what I mean? So it's important to understand Revelations only to the point that you understand the applications from Revelations. It's not important to read a book if you don't understand what it's saying. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, you can read The Hunger Games, and it's an interesting story about you know th this girl from, a, from a, a district of 12 districts. okay? Or you can understand Hunger Games <laughs> and understand what it's talking about with corruption. You know what I mean? There's a difference between reading something and understanding something. Yeah. A lot of people read the Old Testament but don't understand how it applies to them today. Reading versus understanding. <laughs> difference. Um... So once again, just an imbalance of doctrine, um, which next year we're going to focus a lot on um, on themes of the Bible and that kind of stuff, um, kind of in a new way. We'll talk about a lot of doctrines that aren't really essential to salvation, like predestination. We'll talk about you know um, the promised plan of God and the main theme of the Bible, how the law of Leviticus and stuff applies to, to us today, those kinds of things. Um, so... Uh, why study the cults and, and apologetics and, and witnessing tactics and everything we've studied this year? Why study this? St. Patrick was a Roman Catholic that went to the Celts okay, in Ireland. And he did something that hadn't been done in a very long time. He related to the people and then... He planted the seed. What the Roman Catholic Church did is they said, you have to conform to everything that we're doing, and then we'll relate to you. But what Patrick, what he did is he went to the Irish, and he, he, he did things like they did. He, 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 he acted in a way that they would understand, said things in a way that they would understand. He changed the mold of how things had always been done to, to, to change the method of the gospel for a new audience. Amazing stuff that he did. He was able to establish a church in Ireland where no one else was able to because he did that. See what I mean? You can either build a building and tell people, come here, or you can go out to the people and they will build a building. Does that make sense? That, see what I mean? And that's kind of what, what I'm talking about I'm talking about with this. Why study this? Because if you don't know you will repeat the same stupid actions over and over again. You will. It's just a fact of life. Learn to check everything. That's the first thing you learn from, from, from the study of the cults. Check everything. Does somebody say something on a stage? Check it. Oh, well, I saw it on Facebook. Check it. You know, I, I see a lot of stuff on, on Facebook. You know, Obama said this, Obama said that, and I look up on it, and he, didn't, he never said that. Yeah. You know I mean, it's like... It, 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 honestly, people have done the work for you. It's called Snopes. Read it every once in a while. Okay? <laughs> Goodness sakes. But anyways, um, learn to check everything. Don't blindly believe everything. In fact, I even looked up. Um, I even look up sometimes um, if it's important enough what Snopes writes articles on, on whether it's true or not. I even double check that what they write too sometimes if it's important enough. If it's not important enough, and I'm just curious, I just you know read their thing, but. Um, learn to apply the Bible. That's a, that's the second thing we've learned from from this study, this past year long study. We've learned. See, last year I told you read the Bible, and I told you how to. But this year I'm showing you what happens when you don't. I'm showing you how you apply the Bible to beliefs, how you take the Bible and form a doctrine off of it. I, I talked about what the cultists believe, and then I talked about what Scripture shows. So I mean, and you were able to apply Scripture to the cultic setting. Um. Show the importance of Scripture. Throughout the last week, I told you to read the Bible. This week, I showed you what happens when you don't. I mean, this year, I showed you what happens when you don't. I showed you the importance of knowing your Bible, lest you be misled. Um, uh, it prevents false doctrine, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but Paul in, in 1 Timothy shows that false doctrines and false actions go hand in hand. You can't separate the truth. If you believe wrong, you will do wrong. Um, also, one of the dangers from unreasonable faith. Even if you are a Christian, you can have an unreasonable faith that does more harm than good. Atheists will ask you questions and, oh, I just blindly believe it. Well, 
you don't have to blindly believe it. There's pl plenty of proof for it. You know what I mean? You could have actually said something that would have contributed to the spiritual health of that person, but instead you dwelt in, in isolation and ignorance because you wanted to dwell in, you know, your lone rock of, this is faith to me. Faith isn't just blindly holding on to nothing. Peter himself said, I don't, I'm not telling you to believe in nothing. I saw with my own eyes him transform before me. And we read that in the Gospels where it's on the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter saw with his own eyes Jesus with Moses and everything. He saw it with his own eyes. He didn't just blindly believe something. Jesus could have told them, hey, I rose from the dead, FYI. But he showed them that he rose from the dead. And people believed because they saw. And we believe because those people believing went out and died for the faith of the gospel. And so we believe it. The Holy Spirit does witness to us, does bear that to us. But it's not just something that we feel inside. It's something that has factual data behind it. See what I mean? We don't have to be that ignorant Christian out there. Um, so unreasonable faith. But also, you know, we looked at some of these, some of these different belief systems like Christian science that goes beyond reason. Everything around me says that, I'm, that I've got cancer, but I'm going to just deny it. Okay. See what I mean? Unreasonable. Then we also looked at some, some cults that are extremists, like Jonestown. Either do everything we want socially or kill ourselves. Well, that's a little extreme. See what I mean? But then we also looked at the more mild uh, cults, like Mormons, that you can be in your whole life and nothing's going to happen to you physically. You know what I mean? It's fine. You know, but then you get to heaven and, oh, whoops. Uh, whoops. <laughs> I hope you see what I'm saying. So anyways, um, but also show effects of no discipline, wisdom, and discretion. First off, no discipline in, in your life. And Pastor talks about this a lot, um, you know, to different degrees of the role of, of living a disciplined life. But um, the, also the effects of wisdom versus knowledge um, and discretion, you know, knowing not necessarily having the right answer, but knowing how to deliver the right answer. Um so, I mean, through all of this, we come to this conclusion. Science show, talks about the timeless, non-spatial, immaterial um, uh, deity with, that has no physical energy. Well, some people call it Mother Nature, that just has a way, that Mother Nature finds a way. And what we find is this thing that they call Mother Nature is actually God. Yeah. If you watch documentaries and stuff, even, even from atheistic worldviews, they'll talk about Mother Nature as a person. And they talk about Mother Nature doing these things that only a, 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 an actual uh, person could do, a character could do. So who is this, th th this Mother Nature that they're referencing? It's God. They're giving it a different name, but it's God. See what I mean? And so science shows us this. It, it, it has to be a cause for, for everything because everything around us can be dated, which means it has a beginning, which means it has to have come somewhere. See what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but... Science, we're not able to find this God. So then we get to philosophy. God must be good because of morals. We have a sense of morals. All of us have that sense of morals. And because we all desire a sense of purpose. And we all we, we see the world and we see things that are – things just work a certain way. The sun goes up and it's a day, right? Rain comes and it waters the land and the land produces. There's, a, there's ways of the world and there's, there's purpose of the world. It, it, it speaks of something else. You see what I mean? It, it, philosophically speaking. But once again, this doesn't necessarily land us with anything, and also this isn't necessarily true. In philosophy, you arrive at the conclusion, God must be good to reveal himself, but there's nothing necessarily that says, well, what if he just doesn't reveal himself and we're just delving into the dark? Philosophy doesn't tell us that. What if there is no God, and um, you know, and then it doesn't matter one way, one way or another? So, I mean, th this is just for it to make sense, logically. For there to be a God, he would have to be good. So, I mean... But once again, you can arrive at other conclusions too, depending on your worldview. So that doesn't really help us out either. Experience. I feel God. Okay. Um, and, and people's need for something more, that, that, that hole that everybody has in them. Okay. But once again, this is insufficient by itself too. What we find with religion is we find the answer to these things. The God that we've been searching for is explained in the Bible. Science says they would have to be something that exists outside of time, outside of space. The Bible says that God exists outside of time and space. Philosophy tells us that, that God must be good in order to reveal himself, or he hasn't revealed himself at all. Or unless he re did reveal himself, but only to be an a-hole and lord it over people. Well, God, the Bible shows us that God is good, and then he revealed himself to save people and restore them to right relationship. See what I mean? The Bible concludes all the things that all of our speculation over the past year has hinted towards. Um, um, so...
anyways. So this is how we'll end up this week. Um, this is just a simple doctrine of, 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 I mean, a simple example of doctrine deterioration, the way that a doctrine will become corrupted over time. So let's say, um, you know, obviously in the Garden of Eden, you know, sexuality was right, okay? When Adam and Eve left the garden, sexuality was right. But then throughout the course of time, culture made, um, kind of grew wrong views of sexuality. Suddenly sex isn't just for marriage. Then sex isn't just, you know, for women. I mean, sorry, between for, for men, between just men and women. Suddenly it becomes, you know, man and man is fine, woman and woman is fine. That's fine. So you, you just go to the extreme of freedom without any law. But absolute freedom can't possibly exist without law. Morals ho hold in place freedom. See what I mean? Morals without freedom is, is, is legalism. But freedom without morals leads you to bondage. See what I mean? It's it, it, it's a conundrum, a paradox, if you will, that freedom has to be balanced by law. Um, and so, you know, they, they start developing wrong views of, of sexuality, and as a result, the church then sets bad examples. How how did they set bad examples? You had pastors getting getting in se sexually promiscuous things, and especially in like the eighties and stuff. If you guys remember that, um, you know, you have you have pastors, you know being caught in whorehouses you have pastors cheating on their spouses and uh, you know sleeping with underage people you have all these bad things happening and the church not doing a very good example you have married people who are christian yelling at each other all the time in public and just being a terrible example see what i mean um and so the world starts seeing this and you know then you have christians like nowadays for instance where there's a lot of christians who are having sex and they're not even married see what i mean and suddenly it's not a big deal anymore because everybody's doing it. So the church starts getting this idea. It sets a bad example mirroring that culture um, uh, of lifestyle, marriage, and sexual fidelity. Okay. So then it bounces back to the culture again. They mirror that wrong theology. Now they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna continue doing that same thing, except they're gonna take it now a step further, you know, making it worse. Because culture always copies and makes worse. That's what culture does. It's just like the media. Media not only leads culture, it also is a reflection of the culture. See what I mean? They go hand in hand. They, they usher each other forward, um, which we may talk about in the future, but not now. Um, so then, like, for instance, okay, so then the, the culture says, okay, so let's legalize homosexual marriage. See what I mean? And Christians now, now Christians are upset, or not all of them, but, you know, some Christians are really upset because they weren't they weren't having sex before. Now they're having sex. Well, no, they were still having sex. Oh, well, they're trampling over the definition of, of, of marriage. They're trampling over the state definition of marriage god's definition of marriage and sexual morality has not changed so i mean nothing changed the same as his definition didn't change when people in the church were out sleeping around it doesn't matter the people of the world live like the world we are setting the tone it's it's odd that in all the new testament you never have people from the new testament going and yelling at the culture about about all these different things do you odd isn't it just because you have the freedom of speech doesn't mean you should speak. Once again. Um, so then what happens is the government becomes appointed to pick up the slack. In the case of the of the sexual morality thing, well, of course they're, they're going to legalize homosexuality. What logical re re reason without God's morality can you give for them not legalizing it? None. There is none. God is the standard of right and wrong. If you exclude God, there is no reason. The same as eventually it, it could be possible. It could be possible for maybe the age of consent to be changed. Maybe you know um, polygamy to be condoned by by the government. That's possible. It's possible. You know, once again, because the, if something's not being led by God's morals, who's setting the standard? Yeah. Oh, well, I, it felt right to me. Of course, it felt right to you. Having three or four different wives—that sounds like a deal. You get to have sex all the time. See what I mean? It, it becomes a competition where all your wives are trying to please you. Of course, that sounds right to a guy's thinking. Come on. But anyways, um, so then the culture corrupted definition of love and marriage. See what, what isn't that what happened has happened today? They are confused of, as to what love really is. Love is service. Love is love is when somebody does you wrong, doing them right. That's love. But the culture doesn't know that, and so they have a false definition of love. Love is something that I feel within myself that I have to give over to that urge because it's something within myself. So that makes it true and right. Well, no, it doesn't. Um, 
and then, so obviously it crept a definition of marriage too. Um, confused over a definition of homosexual, for instance, people think that you're homosexual just by being tempted. Well, then Jesus is a homosexual. Well, you know, obviously we don't know if he was tempted with that, but I mean he was tempted with other things and he didn't give in. Um, and James says, you know, if you're guilty of one point in the law, you're guilty of all the law. So regardless of whether he was being tempted for this, he still, you know, you see what I mean? All, all sin equally separates us from God is what I was getting at. But um, anyways, um, and so then people start thinking, well, my dad is really harsh on me. That means he doesn't see me as a man. That means I'm not a man. It no longer becomes about chromosome count. That's what makes us a man and a woman, chromosome count. It's that simple. See what I mean? It's not something where you have to do this or do that. Oh, well, I'm a guy and I sew, so I, I must be gay. No, you sew. I'm a woman and I like doing boyish things. Okay. That doesn't make you homosexual either. See what I mean? And so and especially if you go to like and talk to people in like the, the high schools and stuff, very confused as to sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Very – just very confused. Um, and a side note, I wouldn't get too bent out of shape about high schoolers being sexually confused. Um, I would focus more on being there for them. And, you know, honestly, I, sexual I, high schoolers change their sexual perspective every other week, so it's not really that big of a deal. Um, what's more important is showing them the love of God so that they'll learn what is right and wrong. Um, anyways, and so therefore, sexuality is redefined, find, and there's a lack of true love on this foundation, so it just kind of blows up, and that's exactly where we've come to today. A perfect example of a doctrine deterioration. It's the exact same thing with any doctrine that you want to um, bring up. This is how it kind of how it, bring, it brings up. Um, any questions on, on anything we talked about tonight? Maybe a little dry, but it was a culmination of two years, so I felt very important that we needed to go over this. And it'll be posted online. I strongly encourage you, in fact, I'm begging you to go back and, and watch this a couple more times. I want you guys to be effective in your ministries. I want you to be effective in your witnessing. I want you to understand the importance of witnessing. I want you guys to understand the the urgency of witnessing, um, and and really the it's it's no good to study cults if it doesn't lead to something. Yeah. It's no good to study God if it doesn't lead to something. You can know all about God and not serve Him. Angels know know a lot about God, but yet the, a lot of them still disobeyed him and became demons, you know what I mean? So anyways, next week we'll be, we'll be talking about holidays, um, a funner lesson. We've been talking about a lot more serious things, but this one's going to be fun. Um, so. <laughs> I'm excited about that one. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so are just no fun. Um, so we actually have another cult in the area, in Maldives. The Christadelphians. Yeah? Yeah. Where are they? Uh, in La Luz, uh, you know, like... In La Luz? There's like five people in La Luz. <laughs> and, and they've been there um, for a long time. Yeah? What, what do um, they believe? They they got some pretty <laughs> screwy beliefs. Yeah? We, we looked them up. It's, it's not a very big cult. There's about um, eight million total. Well, that's pretty good size. But, um, Beat some of the ones that we talked about. <laughs> it, uh... They don't believe in the deity of Jesus. Okay. They they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, they don't believe in the devil. Okay. Uh, basically, you cease to exist when, when okay. you die. Um, what, what was some other stuff? Uh, Christ's <coughs> death didn't atone uh, our sins. It just paved the way for us to work out our salvation through yeah. works. So this is sounding a lot like some of the ones that we talked about it's, last week. Yeah. You know, um, I believe... No, I don't think it was him. I think it was Seventh-day Adventists that think Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Yeah, no. Jesus' existence began when he was raised by Mary. Yeah. He had no prior existence. He didn't exist. So then John then. 1, 1 is just no. not yes. true. They but the, the Bible, the Bible is the the uh, the authority, but it's based upon how the creator of it. And it's, there's the cult. It started in the 1800s. 1830-something. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. 
<laughs> started in 1830-something. What did I say? What did I say? <laughs> After he got unhappy with the church he was attending. Because they no. Mm -hmm. A lot of the same factors that we've been talking about. Yeah.